Turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 119. We're going to stand and read the entire psalm. (laughs) Well, at least you're listening. (laughs) We will read verses 89 through 96, and I will ask you to stand for that. Psalm 119, verse 89 through verse 96. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth, and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances, for all are your servants. Unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me, but I will consider your testimonies. I have seen the consummation of all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. This is the word of God. Let us obey it. You may be seated. We're going to talk tonight about that God is faithful. So let me ask a rhetorical question of you. Is is God faithful? Anyone would say He's not? Okay, you all affirm that God is faithful, so let me ask you this follow-up question. What does it mean that God is faithful? Be careful what you say yes to until you know what you're being asked. I remember years and years ago, I was teaching a Sunday school class in Southern California, And somebody came up and asked me this question, do you agree with let go and let God? I'd never heard that phrase before, but it sounded right. So I said, "Um, yeah, I guess. I'm not responsible for anything I say right after I teach. My mind's somewhere else. Well, then I asked one of the pastors at the church, somebody asked me this question, let go and let God, and I said, yes, what is What is that? And then he explained to me the Keswick understanding of complete surrender. I don't do anything. God does it all. He repents for me. He obeys for me. Uh, They say it this way, I'm just a suit of clothes that Jesus wears. And then I tried like crazy to find that person again to say, no, 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 you tricked me. So when somebody asks you a question before you say yes, ask them, what do you mean by that? before you get corralled. So what does it mean that God is faithful? I mean, you all said He is. So what does it mean? The word in our text means dependable, firm, certain, secure, steadfast, and trustworthy, as well as simply faithful. The root word for the Hebrew is aman. And I think you can tell that's a derivative of amen. Jesus himself used that often when he would say, verily, verily. Now, when we say something that we think is trustworthy, we say amen at the end, which means let it be or it is true. Jesus didn't wait till the end. Jesus started off by saying, this is true. Like Beretta used to say, take it to the bank. The biblical idea of God's faithfulness is simply that believers can rest secure that God is totally reliable, totally dependable, and infinitely trustworthy. Every day in a thousand ways we're confronted with this question. Can I really trust God with my life? Actually, it would be better and more accurately asked this way, is God trustworthy? That's the question you're asking. We almost choke when we say it like that. If if we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit, I really don't trust God. I mean, we can trust Him to get us to heaven. We just can't trust Him to get us through the end of the month financially. But the reason we don't trust God is because we really don't know God. Now, that's been the recurring theme of my time with you these last few weeks, 
getting to know God as He has revealed Himself in His Word. And that Word is the final authority. Not what you've always been taught. can't tell you how many times people have said to me, well, I, I, I don't understand what you said. You see, I've always been taught. So? Who cares? What you and I think about what God is like is irrelevant. What God says about what He is like is eternally relevant. You may have seen or heard somebody use this phrase, well, God said it and I believe it and that settles it. And you understand immediately that the middle part of that can be tossed out. There's only two parts necessary to that. God said it, that settles it. And it doesn't really matter if you believe it or not. Something is true if it's true whether you believe it or not. There may be somebody in Russia who doesn't believe there's a Disney World. There's still a Disney World. So I want us to look at the faithfulness of God under two headings. God's declaration of His faithfulness and God's display of His faithfulness. First, let's look at what Scripture says about the faithfulness of God. I'll just give you these Scripture texts. You can look them up. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Did you notice that that was restricted? He keeps mercy to a thousand generations to those people. Now, could it be any clearer or more explicit than that? God is the faithful God. And our text from Psalm 119 told us that His faithfulness is to all generations. But will you notice that the faithfulness of God in verse 90 is predicated upon the eternally settled Word of God in verse 89? We don't know God and His faithfulness primarily by our experience, but primarily by divine revelation. We may know Him some by experience, but your experience is fallible. And your experience can't always be trusted. And if you ever elevate your experience above Scripture, this is not the church for you. I remember once when I was a, a single man attending John MacArthur's church, we had so many single people in the church, over 500. It was nice to have pickings. Yeah. <laughs> but we had to hold our Friday night Bible studies in different locations. There were just too many people. And in our particular study, there were two wonderful people. His name was Kelly, her name was Helen. And they started dating, and we were all so excited. Hey, maybe this will work. And they got engaged. <clears throat> and oh, we were just so, they couldn't have been nicer people. Uh, great for him. Yeah, we assume great for her. And then after about a month, she broke off the engagement. And everybody was... Sad for them, brokenhearted. I know Kelly was. And I sat down with her and I said, uh, can I ask you about your decision? She goes, yes. And she was a school teacher at a private Christian school. And I said, I don't understand. Is Kelly a Christian? Oh, yes. He also happened to be an elder at the church. I said, do you think he'd make a good spiritual leader? Oh, I can't imagine a better one. You think he'd be a good father, husband? The best. Um, does he have good character? Yes. Okay, I have to ask you one more question. What's the matter with you? What do you mean? You just affirmed everything a man should be in an re intimate relationship like that and you don't want him? Well, my heart told me it wasn't right. You're what? 
your heart is desperately wicked and more deceitful than anything, why would you listen to that? The story was told of Donald Gray Barnhouse, who preceded the late James Boyce at 10th Press in Philadelphia, that after a sermon, one young man came up to him and said, Dr. Barnhouse, I just want you to know that I gave my heart to Jesus. And Dr. Barnhouse said, what would he want with that dirty old thing? <laughs> God's word is settled forever in the heavens. That's what you trust. You trust what this book says. And you don't trust anybody or anything that disagrees with this book. 2 Peter 1, 2-3 says that everything we desire is a byproduct of the knowledge of the true character of God. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. That's the New American Standards rendering. Everything pertaining. The word pertaining is the root word for pertinent, which means having anything to do with. It's granted everything to us that has anything to do with physical life and spiritual life. Everything. Now, if everything pertaining to life and godliness has been granted to us through the true knowledge of Him, what does that presuppose? There's a false knowledge that grants us nothing at all. So we can deduce that a false knowledge grants us nothing because the true knowledge grants us everything, right? I mean, that's just logical. So trusting God is a byproduct of the knowledge of the true character of God. And in my opinion, that's the greatest need the church has today, a theology proper, the knowledge of God. What is God like? And that's what we're doing here. The Old Testament is the unfolding of the character of God. It's in the Old Testament we see God reveal Himself. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 15. In this chapter, God promises Abram. He's not Abraham yet. He's Abram. An exceeding great reward. Follow along as I begin reading at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram's response shows that he's a product of his culture. Reward? Don't talk to me about a reward. I don't even have a son. Now, Abram at this point was over 100 years old. Sarah is over 90. I don't really even have to mention the bad thinking I on God's part, do I? I mean, let's look at conjugal realities. If grandpa's over 100 and grandma's over 90 and they say, we want to have children now, yeah, and that's what Sarah did. Uh, God, you seem to have forgotten physical realities. I'm over 100, she's over 90. We don't do that anymore. But you know what? When God wants to do something, there are no obstacles. At this point, God told him to do something interesting. He said, verse 5, he brought him outside and said, look towards heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. What do you do when God says, go out and count the stars? You go out and count the stars. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1,005, 1,006, 1,006, 2 million, 19, 2 million, 20, 2, and then you lose count. You've got to start all over again. <clears throat> now put yourself in Abram's shoes for a moment. You don't even have one son, much less millions. 
how are you supposed to respond to this? What are you supposed to do when God tells you to do something that you think is wacky? I mean, for example, take uh, Jesus and Peter. Peter said, I haven't caught a fish all night. Throw your net on the other side. <laughs> no, you didn't hear me. I've been here all night. If those fish were going to get in the net, they'd have done it on this side of the net just as easily on that side of the net. It doesn't really work to argue with God. He knows what he's doing. Peter, put your net over there. All right. You're a carpenter and you're telling me a fisherman how to fish. Whoa! All of a sudden he can't pull them in. There's so many. When God tells you to do something you think is wacky, you do something wacky. Why? Because God said to. What other reason do you need? And the very next verse, verse 6 says, Abram believed God. Some translations say in. The better translations simply say Abram believed God. You know, for you as a Christian, the question is not, do you believe in God? That's pretty apparent. Do you believe God? And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, what form did Abram's belief take? Obedience. Abram could see the stars, but he couldn't see the future. And it's at this point we must remember that the mercies of God are called sure mercies, never swift mercies. It's also the question for us. Do you believe God? Initially, Abram's response was controlled by his finite understanding of the situation, what he could see and experience not the revealed character and trustworthiness of God. All he had to go on was the Word of God, and my friends, sometimes that's all you and I have to go on. Sometimes the Word of God is all we have to support and sustain us. Remember Satan's attempt to uh, destroy Christ in Matthew 3? The Bible tells us that Jesus was baptized. And as he came up out of the water, a voice from heaven... This is not like one of your baptisms over here in the lake. That doesn't happen at your baptism. But after Jesus' baptism, a voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Okay, I'd believe it if that happened. If after my baptism, a voice from heaven, not some ventriloquist somewhere, but an actual voice from heaven came out of the clouds, and said, he's mine, and I'm happy with him. And then it says, <clears throat> immediately, Jesus was taken by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. He's there 40 days, 40 nights, no food. Then Satan and it says, then the tempter came to him. How interesting. He didn't come to him right after his baptism. He didn't come to you right after you get back from church camp. He waited till he was in the weakest possible position. I asked a medical doctor once, what would happen to a man if he was by himself, isolated, did not eat for a month and a half, and didn't have any human contact? He says he would be delirious, he would be depressed, he would have lost about one-third of his body weight, and he would be struggling to stay alive. And then the tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God... Now, what was the last thing Jesus heard before this? The last words he heard were, This is my beloved Son. And the next words he hears are, If you're the Son of God... That's what he did with Adam and Eve. Has God said? The last words they heard from God were, you can eat anything here except that one right there. Don't touch it. No, he didn't say don't touch it. Don't eat from it. Now when Satan comes, he says, really, is that what God said? And Eve distorted what God had said. 
He said, don't eat from it or touch it lest you die. We have no record that God ever said, don't touch it. Good idea. I mean, why play with fire? But then she let her experience take over. When she saw that the tree was desirable, looked good, her focus is gone now. She's not focusing on God. She's focusing on the immediate situation. In Christ's situation, what did his circumstances tell him? Does he trust his senses, his feelings, his experiences, or does he trust what God said? How far are we supposed to take this? Write down these scripture texts and you can read them for yourself later tonight. Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3, the psalmist basically says, I don't care what I see. Though the mountains quake and the oceans tremble and the mountains be pulled into the sea. I mean, how would it be if when I finally let you go here tonight, you walked outside and there's nothing there? I don't mean different stuff. I mean, it's black, gone, everything is gone. Um, Lord, what's going on here? The psalmist says, I don't care what I see. And in Psalm 77, he says, I don't care what I feel. Verses 7 to 14. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 to 18, I don't care what I experience. Or in Job chapter 13, I don't care if God kills me, I'm still going to trust Him. Now, how can these people come to these conclusions? Because my experience does not alter the revealed character of God. And I dare not elevate my experience over God's Word. For example, the Bible says, My God shall supply all your needs through His riches in Christ Jesus but I'm in a terrible marriage and my needs are not being met. I thought you believed the word, which just says, my God shall supply all your needs. You don't have a need, you have a desire. Well, I have a need to be happy. Uh, you don't. There's no command in the Bible to be happy. You're not sinning by being unhappy. You might be sinning by complaining about it. You don't need a 55-inch TV. You may desire one, but you don't need one. In fact, you don't even need a TV at all. We'd all be better off without them. But if my God says that He will supply all our needs through His riches in Christ Jesus... And I say, but I have a need. Which one of us is lying? Okay, the Bible says that God will supply all my needs. And I think I need something. So I guess I don't. Needs are what God meets. And yet, you know, for a wife or a husband to go to their partner and say, you're not meeting my wants. That just doesn't sound quite as impactful. <laughs> yeah, so? Well, I want something from you. Yeah, so? You're insensitive. <laughs> I'm a guy, so? How can these people affirm God when all of their senses and all of their circumstances scream otherwise? It's the same question Abram asked. What proof do I have? Isn't that what he said? He said, how shall I know? I mean, wouldn't God have been justified in responding like this? Excuse me? How shall you know? You know because I said that's the way it would be. That's how you shall know. Listen, if you can't trust me, I'll find somebody else to bless. See ya. Now, if I was God, that's how it would have happened. That's how I know that scenario. God would have been justified in doing that to Abram's unbelief. Fortunately, 
It's not what God determined to do. God said, you're going to have a son. What happened? They had a son. Through the normal means that sons have always been begotten. Uh, It's just amazing to me that when God wants to do something, nothing's in the way. I love the story about uh, Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Jesus is with his disciples quite a distance away. And he gets word. Somebody comes to him and says, you need to come to Mary and Martha's house. Lazarus is sick. He's dying. And Jesus says, it's not time yet. No, he's dying. It'll take us days to get there. Not time yet. Then the word comes that Lazarus has died. And Jesus says, all right, let's go. Now, if you'd been a disciple, can you imagine the looks you'd have given Jesus? Now it's time. So he makes the trip. They all walk to where Mary and Martha's house is. Martha comes out and really gives Jesus the what for. You know, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. Thanks for nothing. Jesus says to her, you're worried about too many things. You don't need to worry about this. There's only one thing is needful. That's that you be in a right relationship to God. That's the only need you have. When you start talking about needs, he says only one thing is needful. That's the only need you have. By the time they get to the house, Lazarus has been dead three days. He says to the disciples, time now. (laughs) Can you imagine the rolling of the eyes? Now it's time? Yes, go roll away the stone. Okay. Go in and make sure he's dead. You know what he's doing. If he does it, Before a certain time, nobody will believe the miracle. They'll say, he wasn't even dead. He was just sleeping in there. Why you would go into a grave and roll the stone behind you to sleep, I'm not sure. So he sends a couple disciples to go check on him. And they come out and he says, is he dead? And I think this is dripping with sarcasm. He stinks. Okay. Now it's time. Lazarus, come here. And I heard one man say, you know why he specified Lazarus? Because the power that he had with him, if he didn't say Lazarus, every dead person in the country would have gotten out of the graves and walked forward. Lazarus, come here. Here comes Lazarus. You rang? When God wants to do something, nothing is an obstacle. The angel comes to Mary and says, you're going to have a son. She goes, "Um, I've never known a man. It's too soon. She had a son. Mary and Martha's case, it's too late. Abram and Sarah, we're too old. None of that kept God from doing what he wanted to do. In Hebrews 13, God commands us to be content. Turn with me to that passage, please. Hebrews chapter 13, I know it's a familiar one to you. In verse 5, he says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Notice the next phrase. For he himself has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. In the English rendering, there are two negatives. Never and nor. But in the Hebrew, there are five negatives. This is the most emphatically negative statement in the Bible. This is a quote, by the way, from the Old Testament. That's why I'm saying in the Hebrew. If we rendered it literally, it would read like this. I will not leave you, no, I will not forsake you, under no circumstances, no, I most certainly will not. Get the point? 
And please don't miss why we're to be content in that verse. For He has said. It's because of what God has said about Himself we're to be content. Not because it works out the way we want it to. We believe because that's what God said. God said it, and that settles it. Now in response to Abram's question back in Genesis about how he could know, God's answer was this. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land. You don't make a covenant, by the way. You cut a covenant. Circumcision on a male child is a covenant. It's a cutting of the flesh, literally. God had Abram collect certain animals. Now, in that day, when two people cut a covenant, they used prescribed animals. They would cut the animals in half from head to toe or beak to toe. They would lay the halves of the animals side by side, and the two parties would walk barefoot through, literally, the blood of the covenant. What's the significance of that? The two parties were saying to each other, if I fail to keep my part of this covenant, you may do to me what we did to those animals. Pretty great incentive for a man to keep his word, wasn't it? If I don't keep my word, I die. Now, what's the significance of the fact that God put Abram to sleep and passed through the pieces of the animals himself? Simply this, God wasn't going to trust the success of this covenant to Abram. And as Hebrews tells us, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And in doing so, he virtually announced to the world, if I ever fail to keep my word, I will cease to exist. You know, that's better than cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. In fact, now that I think of it, that's exactly what God is saying. Cross my heart and I will die. But the scripture tells us that God cannot, cannot die, ergo, he can't fail to keep his word. What's the outcome? Genesis 21, then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time. When did Sarah have a son? At the appointed time. It may not have been Sarah's time, but it was the time that God had in mind. God may or may not work on our time schedule. In fact, He rarely does. Would you agree? But that's not important. What is important that you and I work on His time schedule. We can trust God because of what He's said, because of His character, because of His trustworthiness, not because He has lived up to our expectations. Again, hymns are terrible places to get your theology. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him or and or. In that song, the basis for trusting God is that He's come through. That's not the basis for trusting God. doesn't matter how many times you've proved Him or and or. That has no bearing on anything. We can trust God because of Scripture truth. Your experience is not a greater standard than Scripture truth. Well, it didn't happen that way for me. So? Scripture must define and validate our experiences, not the other way around. And it's so important to remember here that based on the immutability of God, the fact that God neither can nor will change, we must remind ourselves if God is ever faithful, he will always be faithful. Since he cannot change, if he's faithful once, he must be eternally faithful. What God is, he always is. Now go back to the Psalm 119 passage, because we can see that as well here. God's word, according to verse 89, is unchangeably fixed. His faithfulness is to all generations. He has established the earth, and it abides. 
Now watch closely the next part. They continue to this day according to thy ordinances. The word they is a plural word. The word earth is a singular word. So what does they refer to? It has to refer to something more than the earth. What does it refer to? To God's faithfulness and the earth. You see, even God's faithfulness is dictated by His ordinances, which is His word. We will have no more trust in God's faithfulness than we have in His Word. And we will trust in His Word proportionately to the time spent studying it. Notice also the illustration that God gives us of His faithfulness. It is the constancy of His creation. You have established the earth and it abides. There's a constancy in the seasons. You wouldn't know that living in Florida where it's 80 degrees in February. But in the rest of the civilized world where they actually have seasons, it is that way. You have two seasons here in Florida. Unbelievably hot and not quite as hot. That's it. Summer always follows spring, which always follows winter, which always follows fall which always, always follows summer. It never changes. It's forever the same. It's always fixed. Day always follows night. The sunrise comes every morning. The evening comes every night. It's forever the same. Fire is always hot. Ice is always cold. The law of gravity never changes. The tides are always subject to the moon. Dogs always bark. Cats always purr. Cows always have calves, they never have puppies, and on and on it goes. These things are fixed by a fixed deity. They are unchanging because He is unchanging. These are just illustrations of His character. It's because nature is so fixed that we apprehend the God of nature to be so faithful. God is faithful, says the Scripture. But His faithfulness is only an illustration of His unchanging nature. The immutability of God is the foundation of His faithfulness. He can't change. He can't mess you up by doing it different. He can't fail because He can't change. And something that is forever the same is by its very nature trustworthy because it's certain and sure. He is, as the Scripture tells us, forever the same. There's no variation or shadow of turning with Him. That's what we sing. If you don't believe that, don't sing it. You don't praise God by lying to Him. The world passes away, we're told, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And if the faithfulness of God shows itself so clearly in this temporary world, how much more can we count on the faithfulness of God's word, which has a vastly higher place in the counsels and fulfillments of eternity? In fact, the psalmist tells us God has exalted His Word above His very name. And His faithfulness is predicated upon that exalted Word. When we look at the matter of God's faithfulness, we have to realize that His faithfulness is first to Himself and to His own purposes. In other words, God could no more fail to be faithful than He could fail to exist. The assurance of our salvation is predicated upon God's faithfulness. Faithful is He who called you, who will bring it to pass. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins, etc. And when God wants to distinguish His faithfulness from any lesser kind, in Numbers 23, He compares Himself to man. God is not a man that He should lie. And to show you what kind of lie he's incapable of, it's that of not doing what he says he will do. God said it. That settled it. Let me ask you this. When has God shown himself to be untrustworthy? When has he failed to be faithful? I mean, isn't the question really this one? When has he failed to live up to my expectations? And when did God promise he would do that? Nothing will kill a relationship like expectations. I uh, did a little counseling for a couple about to get married. 
So the first thing I want you to do is write down all your expectations. And then I said, I said, did you know any of those expectations? I had no idea. So you think you could live up to that list? He goes, nobody could live up to that list. I said the same thing to her. Did you know that that's what he expected of you after marriage? She goes, no. I said, can you live up to that? Said, I'm not even going to try. Expectations will kill a relationship, particularly the ones that aren't spoken. Well, I just naturally assumed that you were going to, and why would you assume that for a moment? Did I ever tell you I was going to do that? Well, no, I just assumed. John Collings was a 17th century Puritan, and he wrote a massive work on providence. He has an entire sermon where his point is that God rarely answers the expectations of his people. He shows that God always fulfills His promises, but He's under no obligation or inclination to live up to our expectations, which are largely self-centered. So often we think that if we understand things, we have control of them. Christ continually checked the curiosity of His disciples and their questions. They said, when is it time to restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, it's not something you need to know. When Peter asked him, what shall this man do? Christ said to him, what's that to you? How is that your business? We want to know everything and see it all up front, and yet faith is the evidence of things what? Not seen. The Scripture gives us two grounds for trusting God. One is His Word, and the other is His track record. And in the mind of God, both of those are sufficient without any further proof. Is there assurance of salvation? Well, Jesus said, of all those that the Father has given me, I've never lost one. Good enough for me. I'd hire a guy who based said that on his resume. All of that was the first point. Now we'll look at the second one more briefly, I promise. The display of God's faithfulness. Or what I'm going to call God's track record. The psalmist declares in Psalm 89.1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. And here again we have the idea of telling ourselves and others the truth. There's a movie coming out around Christmas time called Unbroken. <clears throat> it's about, some of you older folks will know this name, Louis Zamperini. Back in the first half of the last century, he was an Olympian, a great track star, and then he was a, a war hero. Excuse me, he was shot down over the ocean and rescued and put in a Japanese prisoner of war camp where he was beaten regularly. In 1949, by the way, he was converted at a Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles. Very anxious to see if Hollywood puts that in the movie. But when he was training for in high school to run track, he would, as anybody else would, run out of gas. He said to his dad, who was training him, his dad said, keep going. He said, dad, it hurts. Lewis, if you can take it, you can make it. And that sustained him when he was getting beaten in prisoner of war camp. And he said to the other guys, if you can take it, you can make it. You know, there are so many things that come out of our mouths. Here are two that would be more helpful to us than 99.9% .9 of them. The mercies of God and the faithfulness of God. If you want to do something interesting, ask your parents, if they're believers, how did you ever make it? Not only in marriage, but just... My folks had five boys. My dad called us his house apes. <laughs> as far back as I can remember, when he became a California highway patrolman, his take-home pay was $250 a month. And they took $50 a month out of his check for his gun and his uniform. So he took home... Uh, 200 a month. 
with five boys. I don't know how they did it. I mean, I know we didn't have much. Our lunch sack had to last an entire week. Lunch box? <laughs> Please. We had that French delicacy, mustard sandwiches. Mustard between two slices of bread. You know, we bought for 18 years that that actually was a French delicacy <laughs> because the mustard was French's brand. And a handful of potato chips and an apple. And I remember other kids opening their lunchbox and seeing something called Twinkies. I want one. You want to trade a mustard sandwich? <laughs> yeah, that'll work. Ask your parents, how did they make it? Let them tell you about God's faithfulness. And yet when I watch clips, the old home movies that they've had put on DVDs for us, every Christmas there were Christmas presents under the tree. Bicycles. Microscopes. Every birthday there was a cake. I don't know how they did it. Well, I do know how they did it because I've become parents and so they sacrificed. They did without so that we could have. Let them tell you about that. It will greatly increase your appreciation for them. We should be reminding ourselves of the mercy of God. We should be telling ourselves and our children and our grandchildren of God's faithfulness. Talk to them about it. Tell them about it. The reason to study the Old Testament is to see the repeated faithfulness of God to His people and to His purposes. And that's why we sing this hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. When the psalmist declares, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, he gives us a good example. He may have felt forsaken. And you may have felt forsaken. You've never been forsaken. And there's a vast difference between feeling forsaken and being forsaken. Christ was forsaken. You're not. And that perfect track record involves us as well. <clears throat> One of my favorite passages of the Scripture is in 1 Corinthians, where Paul makes this declaration. God always leads us in His triumph and manifests through us the sweet aroma of Him in every place. Now that's two universal statements in one sentence. Here's the setting. Paul had gone to Troas to preach the gospel, and he says the door was wide open. I mean, that's like you going around doing door-to-door -door evangelism. Hi, I don't know who you are, but I've been wanting to find Jesus. Could you come in and tell me how I could do that? That's that situation. But Paul was unable to find Timothy, upon whom he depended greatly for support and fellowship. So he says, so I left and moved on. And I've heard people castigate Paul. Poor Paul, he was so lonesome. No fellowship. But for whatever reason, Paul didn't do that, and here's how he assessed the situation. God always leads us in His triumph. What does that mean? It means this, since God can't fail, I can't fail either. Because God always leads us in His triumph. And notice whose triumph it is. God's triumph, not yours. God's. And He always leads me in it. That's a perfect track record. I'm in Christ and he never fails, so I can't fail either. But there's a second part to this that I love. How many times have you and I, in times of self-deprecation and over uh, self-condemnation, felt that as a Christian we just stink the joint up? Am I the only one? I saw all of you bail on me when I said that. God, I'm so sorry for the way I live today. I just stick the joint up. No, you don't. He always leads us in triumph and manifests through us the sweet aroma of Himself in every place. It's His triumph, but the aroma comes through us. 
How many times have we let God down and ruined what seemed like a perfect opportunity? And yet, we've got to tell ourselves the truth. God always leads me in His triumph and manifests through me the sweet aroma of Himself in every place. He always does that. He never does not do that. So no matter how down on yourself you get, you can't if God says otherwise. It's our job to be faithful. It is God's job to be successful. And He never fails, not in Himself and not in you and not in me. So the first way we learn about the faithfulness of God is through His revealed Word. The second way is through our afflictions. In Psalm 119, David declares, If it hadn't been for God's law, His Word, He would have perished in His afflictions. And he said, It is good for me that I was afflicted. And the reason it was good is that it drove him and forced him to the Scriptures. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. We're studying the doctrine of the faithfulness of God but it's through God's afflicting hand we learn by experience what's taught in Scripture. God said it, and that settles it. You better believe it. One last thing. Psalm 139.1 tells us we're to sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, and that with our mouth we're to make known God's faithfulness to all generations. What a heritage to leave behind. What a legacy to give our children and our grandchildren. Our lifelong stories of the faithfulness of God. That is what we are to tell them. Let us make that our goal, to instruct our posterity in the faithfulness of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your testimony about Your faithfulness. You said it, and that settles it. And now may we live according to the word. In Jesus' name, amen.